Teresa de los Santos, who is the author of most recently Fallen Together. She's in town for the Southern Festival of Books, and we're here to just chat with her a little bit about her new novel. Thanks for talking to us today. Oh, thanks for having me here. So, could you give a brief synopsis of the book for people who haven't read it? Um, the book is about three friends, um, a man and two women, who meet in their first week of their first year of college. And um, under kind of dramatic circumstances. And they form a really close and almost immediate bond with each other. And um, remain friends, and really close friends, almost to the exclusion of other um, uh, intimate relationships all through college. And then after college, they graduate, they go, they move to Philadelphia together. Um, and their friendship continues for several years after that. And then um, I think the kind of pressures of, of the adult world and um, and other complicated reasons, I, I, they end up, their friendship has to radically change or it has to end. And it ends. It doesn't just end, but it ends um, kind of explosively. And the three of them um, separate, Penn, Penelope, um, who I think emerges as the main character. Mm -hmm. She stays in Philadelphia, and the other two leave. And they don't see or speak to each other for six years. Um, when the book opens, that's where they are. And um, Penn gets an email from Kat that says um, something like, I'm sorry for everything. Um, I know it's been forever, but I need you. Mm -hmm. Can you please come to our reunion? There are 10-year college reunions coming up. And Will, the other part of the trio, um, gets the same email. So they go down to um, meet, to see Cat, to help Cat. And what they find there is, is very unexpected. And they, they end up going on this long search together, this journey together, the friends, um, that takes them very, very far afield. So, <laughs> so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and as you said, this is a really intense friendship, and a lot of people outside it don't understand it and kind of assume there's this thing running through the novel where people assume that it's a romantic relationship. Right. Um, do you, why do you think people have trouble understanding friendships like that, and do you think they're more rare than romantic relationships? Um, you know, <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's, there's a, there are good reasons why people don't get this friendship. And um, because really... I mean, it's two women and a man, so the configuration of it is sort of unusual. Um, but I think any friendship between people of the opposite sex um, is kind of difficult for others, outsiders, to get their minds around, mainly because I think our culture and our society and our parents, and I, I mean, you probably, you know, they're all pushing us in the direction of romance. If, you know, you find someone, you, you love them, you trust them, you kind of relate to them on all kinds of levels, so why not just date, you know? So I think it's, um, and really I think that, that Cat, Will, and Penn are able to have this friendship because they sort of, from the beginning, take romance off the table. I mean, they have to almost overtly and deliberately say, we are never doing that. We are just not going to be attracted to each other. It's not going to happen. And then their friendship, once that's kind of, Take, taken out of the equation, then their friendship can thrive mm -hmm. um, and, and be what it is. But yeah, I, I don't think it's that common, honestly. And do you think there's something especially intense about college friendships, like that environment that allows these kind of... I know that was true for me. Um, I think so. I mean, I think yeah. um, for most of us, we are, are leaving our family, um, our, our kind of first family that we grew up with, mm -hmm. um, and we are creating our own kind of family pieced together by people who we meet in college. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think that is a particularly intense kind of enterprise. I also think that it's an age, um, I mean, for, mm -hmm. it's also college where there's, there's not a lot going on besides relationships and school. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, apart from academics and, and friendships and other relationships, there's not that much to spend your energy on. And there are a lot of late nights yeah. A lot of coffee, a lot of, you know, sometimes wine. I mean, you know, yeah. you stay up and you reveal and you talk and you mm -hmm. have these, you know, in well, well into the wee hours conversations. And I, and there's not 
afterwards that same kind of time for that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do think um, they're they're pretty intense. And I found when I was in my late teens, early twenties, and kind of just discovering who I was, mm -hmm. um, or you know, the the shape, the kind of adult shape that I would come to fill, I. Um, I want really wanted to be known to people, you know, and, and I think a lot of people in college feel like that, like, like they, they just hand it all over, mm -hmm. here's who I am, you know, and, and they want also to know people mm -hmm. in that very kind of deep way, and, and there's time for it, so yeah, I do think it's unique. So you mentioned this trip that they go on kind of to find each other, and um, one, I think one of the big pleasures of the book is reading about their trip, they go to the Philippines, and um, first of all, your descriptions are really beautiful. Of Thank the country, you. So obviously, you you know love it a lot yourself. And second of all, life kind of really opens up for Penn on that trip, mm -hmm. which is really fun to read about. Um, and you're half Filipino. When did you first go to the Philippines? And was your experience anything like Penn's? Well, um, I didn't go to the Philippines until I was in my early twenties. It was really soon, right after college, maybe a year out of college. Um, Prior to that, you know, the Philippines is always kind of, the government's sort of crazy, and, and, and during the Marcos regime, my dad really never wanted us mm -hmm. to go. And um, we, but, but I did go then, and it was really pretty transformative. I mean, it was one of those trips that um, is a milestone, uh, because not only did I discover a place that I had never been to mm -hmm. that was radically different from the place I grew up in Virginia. I went to the University of Virginia, so I was like right out of Charlottesville and went to this um, radically different place. Um, gorgeous, troubling, you know, just uh, all kinds of things. And um, I met a whole branch of my family that I had only, I mean, maybe I'd seen one or two of them in brief visits mm -hmm. to the United States, but I had not really spent time with them. And, and when, when Penn goes, um, she spends time with Kat's family, father's mm -hmm. family. And this, these kind of very strong matriarchal women and this kind of family compound with several houses on a piece of property and children running everywhere. And, and that was very much my experience. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, thank you for saying that about the writing because I really... Um, I suspect that not that many of my readers have been to the Philippines, no, yeah. and I wanted to kind of pay it tribute. You know, I wanted mm -hmm. to make the make the writing so good that it evoked at least something about the country yeah. that felt real. I think it really does come alive. Yeah, thanks. Um, so your last two books shared some character overlaps. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see yourself writing about any of the characters from Falling Together in the future? You know, not right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of one of those writers with one idea at a time. Okay. So um, I have friends who have, you know, desktop folders full of, packed full of ideas. I'm very resentful of that. But no, you know, um, I have a fourth book that I'm working on. It's all new characters, not related to the first two. And really, with the first book, I never intended to write a second book mm -hmm. with those characters. It just happened to be the idea that kind of fe fell to me to write. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, um, well, I didn't set out, certainly, the first, when I started writing the first book, thinking this will be a two-book kind of thing. Um, and it wasn't until I was almost finished with the first book that I started to understand that this is what I would do for the second. Mm -hmm. And it was really because of that was the idea. There, were no, there was no other idea. So no, no, not, I mean, I would love to, um, I miss my characters as soon as I finish writing. I would love yeah. to meet up with them again a few years later later, you know, past the end of the book and see what they're up to, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't okay. know if I'll get to. <laughs> um, and Love Locked In was your first novel, um, and it was optioned for film, like, right after you, you know, it was published, or maybe even before. Before. It um, was actually before, yeah. Okay. Do you have any news on that adaptation? Do you, you know, that's not, I don't think that's going before. to happen. Yeah. Um, they optioned it, and then they um, re-optioned it, and had it for a long time, and tried, I'm told, although I never saw them, um, a, a number of scripts from mm -hmm. different writers, and just couldn't find one that everybody liked. And um, 
and so that got shelved, and mm -hmm. uh, so in that kind of incarnation, I don't think it's going to happen. Maybe, a, maybe another. Um, I mean, there is always a little of interest in it, but so far, um, no, no movie in the works. Well, you've done some screenwriting, right? Have you ever considered adapting any of your books yourself? You know, I did some screenwriting with my husband as kind of a okay. kind of for fun. Mm -hmm. um, we we had an agent, we had a representation for a while in Los Angeles, um, but it, it 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 never happened. You know, the the funny thing about that first book, particularly, but mm -hmm. yeah, for all of them, is that people will read them and say, "Oh, I can so see this as a movie." And, and I think the first book particularly lends itself to that because mm -hmm. um, it's got tons of movie references, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I think there are scenes that really wouldn't take a lot of changing to turn them into mm -hmm. a, a movie scene. They're sort of self-contained and. Um, but the trouble I think that people have with that, that I know I would have if I tried to write a screenplay for, for Love Walked In, is it's a first-person narration mm -hmm. um, from Cornelia's point of view. And there's a lot, a lot I think, of the appeal of that book, and this is what readers tell me, is her voice. Yeah. And so how do you reproduce that voice? How do you make, without having a voiceover, mm -hmm. which most people you know, don't really want to do. Like, how do you kind of uh, make that, the charm of that voice come mm -hmm. through in a film? So I think that's kind of, uh, that's certainly what I would struggle with if I were writing it. No, I don't want to write it. <laughs> I want someone else to do it. I just want to write novels. <laughs> well, since you're here for the Southern Festival of Books to kind of interact with readers, and I know you've already made a couple of stops on this tour for this book, um, what's your favorite thing about meeting the people who've, who've enjoyed your work? Do you have any memorable stories? From um, you know, oh, I'm sure I have all kinds of stories. But the thing that's uh, it's amazing, I mean, this is my third book, and there are kind of two things that just n knock the wind out of me every time. And one is seeing it. So mm -hmm. when I, I usually get bo a box of books before it comes out, and, I'm, and I see it, and I think, oh... Wow, like this is real. This is going to be. This is an object that's going to, you know, take mm -hmm. its place in, in the world of objects. And it's also. I mean, how did I? I mean, you know, how did I do this? <laughs> I, I didn't write it. I, it. It was excruciating for me to even write a paper that was twenty pages long. So to, to look at all those pages and think, wow, I wrote that. It, it blows me away. The second thing that really always um, kind of takes me off guard is uh, meeting people who've actually read it. I think there's. There's a part of me, I mean, most of the time, while knowing that this isn't true, I think most of the time I feel like the, that only people who know me have read, the, <laughs> have read my books, my family, my friends. And, and so when I meet readers and they talk to me about how um, my book has mattered to them and, and, and they're living in Portland, Oregon, or they're living in, in, in Nashville, I, I just think... Oh, wow. you know, it, it, it's, it blows me away. I, I still can't get, it's such an honor and a privilege to, to touch anyone um, mm -hmm. in that way. But all these strangers, mm -hmm. you know, it's really, um, I, I, I don't know if I would ever get used to it. I sort of hope not. But, um, you know, I, as for an, 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 a specific encounter, I don't know, you know, I have... Um, I, it, what's funny to me with the first two books is that people would meet me and they just thought I was Cornelia. Oh. And Cornelia in the first two books is tiny. She's like five feet tall. Mm -hmm. She's tiny. She has this super short haircut. Um, and they'll meet me and they'll say, oh my gosh, you're so tall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I get to be tall. I'm not that tall, but I'm taller than Cornelia. Um, and I think... It's interesting to see how people think, okay, I have to now mm -hmm. make this adjustment in my thinking that this writer is not her character. Yeah, I think that's a mistake, readers. Or well, not a mistake, but something that readers do, maybe almost subconsciously, yeah. is kind of conflate the author with their characters. Well, what it said to me, really, was that I did my job. You mm -hmm. know, that this right. character came alive for them, felt so real to them, that this voice felt so much like a real person's voice that they mm -hmm. thought it was mine. You know, yeah. and so they thought they were meeting the that flesh and blood person. Yeah. So I think... I took it as a compliment, and and um, 
Also, being tall, I, I, you know, that's a compliment. So that's, I think, been something really interesting. This book, because it's not a first-person narration, I don't know that that will happen mm -hmm. as much, but um, uh, that's, that, that's something that's been pretty fun. Well, I'm sure there are elements of your characters that you base on your own life, or, you know, people you know, and things like that. Sure. I mean, the, you know, there's no character in any of my books who matches up with a specific character right. in the real world, mm -hmm. and certainly not with me. Um, and if there, I mean, I'm sure, you know, mostly what I steal from real life for my characters um, are very small details um, of a turn of phrase that someone uses repeatedly. Or um, in, my, in my second book, there's a character named Piper who, when she gets nervous, she smooths her hair and she always has to have her watch band with the face right in the middle of her wrist. And I've known people who do those mm -hmm. things. Um, in this book, uh, in Falling Together, Penn is afraid of flying, and I've always been afraid of flying. And so the parts where I was writing her fear of getting on this airplane to go to the Philippines, which is a very long flight, um, came, I drew, of course, from mm -hmm. my own fears. Um, and I liked how she said that um, it was kind of seeing her daughter on the plane. When yeah. She suddenly felt more comforted because she thought there was no way. A plane could come Nothing bad can happen to this child. Yeah. That's how I feel when I travel with my kids. Mm -hmm. And the first time I went on a long flight with them, they've been to the Philippines three times, I think, now. Um, I was so anxious until we got on the plane. And then I saw them, and I, they're so comfortable in their own skin. Mm -hmm. They're so, you know, alive. And I just thought, nothing can happen. Mm -hmm. we're, we're safe because they're here. So it was actually the opposite of yeah. what I expected. No way anything bad's happening mm -hmm. to these people. Well, are there other authors you're looking forward to seeing at the festival this weekend? Um, sure, there are. I mean, Chris Bojalian and I have done um, other events together, and he's okay. really lovely. Yeah, he's um, coming here later today. There's a, a, a hot new author named Erin Morgenstern, who mm -hmm. um, wrote The Night Circus. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to talk to her. I haven't read it yet, but um, it sounds so wildly inventive and... and um, wonderful and like the kind of book that I would love and probably would never ever be able to write so I would love to meet her um there's a guy named uh I think his name's Chad Harbach who wrote um The Art of Fielding and my husband is just finishing it really loves it he we sort of get books and we he reads it and then I read it or I read it and he mm -hmm. reads it so I haven't read it yet but um again it sounds like my cup of tea exactly mm -hmm. so I would I'm, I'm excited to meet those writers well, great. Well, thank you so much for talking to oh, us today. Oh, thank really you. It's it. been a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.